Let's turn to uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 17. We begin tonight with verse 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. The expectation is that this might be the time in which he will proclaim himself as Messiah and establish the kingdom. However, when the Pharisees were demanding when he was going to establish the kingdom, theirs was not a question of interest but it was done in a very sarcastic way. This is not a question that is born out of uh, a desire to be a part of his kingdom, but it is uh, just something of uh, antagonism really on their part. Now, Jesus had spoken often of the kingdom of God. I think if you go through the Gospels, you'll find some 85 places where Jesus made reference to the kingdom of God. It was really almost the heart of his teaching. Many of the parables that Jesus gave related to the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Now the kingdom of God is likened to a man. And so many times he began parables of the kingdom of God, giving us illustrations of truths concerning the kingdom. He told his disciples that they were to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In other words, that was to be the top priority of their lives. And we as disciples, this should also be the top priority of our lives. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In the model prayer that he gave to his disciples, the first petition of the model prayer is petitioning for the kingdom to come. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So it is something that was paramount on the mind of Christ. And now that he is heading towards Jerusalem, their question is, when is the kingdom of God going to come? The Jews had been waiting for their Messiah. For they believe that when Messiah comes, he's going to establish the kingdom of God upon the earth. They've been waiting for the fulfillment of the promise of Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David to order it and to establish it in righteousness and in judgment from henceforth, even forever, saith the Lord. So the eternal kingdom of God as the Messiah comes to sit on the throne of David and to reign as king, not only over Israel, but over the whole earth. 
Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. The eternal, everlasting kingdom. He is to reign over the earth. The kingdoms of our Lord have become the kingdoms of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. In the second chapter of Daniel... As the Lord is interpreting the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, he said, And during the days of those ten kings shall the Lord of glory come and establish a kingdom that shall never end. And it speaks about the Lord establishing his reign over the earth. The reign is to be a righteous reign. Luke, I mean, Isaiah chapter 11 prophesies of this reign of Jesus Christ, and it begins by speaking of the anointing of God's Spirit to rest upon him. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, and he shall slay the wicked. The righteous shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The quality of the kingdom is the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall feed and their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the nursing child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. So they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The promises of the kingdom glorious age. The animals will no longer be ferocious. A little child will lead a lion around, grab him by the mane and lead, lead him around. I imagine they'll be fun to ride, actually. <laughs> grab hold of the mane and go for it, you know. But glorious promises of the kingdom of God Jerusalem is to become the center of the earth, Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. And Isaiah actually speaks more of the kingdom than any of the other Old Testament prophets. The book of Isaiah is just full of the uh, blessings of the kingdom. Verse 2 of Isaiah 2, It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and he shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. And so the question, Lord, when are you going to establish the kingdom? Was a question that was paramount in the minds of the disciples, but theirs was a sincere desire. This was a cynical question on the lips of the Pharisees. But again, 
The earth is to be restored like it was before the fall of man. And we'll look at one more passage from Isaiah, the 35th chapter, as Isaiah here speaks of the glories of the kingdom of God. Now, uh, this is what we're longing for. This is what we're praying for. This is what we're anticipating. And this is why it upsets me whenever we're talking about the coming of the Lord and, and all people say, oh, doom and gloom prophet. Yeah, doom and gloom. There's not going to be war anymore. <laughs> They're going to take the military budgets and use them for agricultural development. Children will be able to play in safety. You won't have to worry about wild animals or anything else. And, and then going on in verse 35, I mean chapter 35, the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say unto them that are of fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with that recompense, and he will come and save you. And then the eyes of the blind shall be open. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as the deer, and the tongue of the dumb will sing. For out of the wilderness shall waters break forth and streams in the desert and the parched ground shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water in the habitation of dragons where each shall uh, lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes and a highway shall be there away and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it but it shall be for those the wayfaring men though fools shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there, and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Doesn't sound like doom and gloom at all to me. Sounds like something I could enjoy very, very much. You know... What is doom and gloom is the TV news reports every night. Amen. You want to talk about doom and gloom. This fellow who raped that girl and cut off her arms, left her for dead. Seven years ago, they're going to turn him loose. Maybe in our community, who knows? I just, I saw the fellow interviewed on TV. I don't think this guy is ready to come into society. It upsets me to see what's happening in our world today. To realize that crime is so rampant. So many people destroying themselves with drugs, with alcohol. The threat of nuclear destruction. Talk about doom and gloom. You're living in a world of doom and gloom. The only hope for this world of doom and gloom is the glorious kingdom of God, the kingdom of peace and of righteousness, where love will prevail. It's far from doom and gloom. Pharisees now are demanding, Lord, when's this all going to happen? The disciples were also interested when it was going to happen in the book of Acts chapter 1 after Jesus rose from the dead and he appeared to them up at the Galilee. They then returned to the area of Jerusalem. 
And just before he ascended into heaven, he said, Now, wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father, which I've told you about. For John baptized you with water under repentance, but you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. The disciples said, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They, they were asking the same question as the Pharisees. Lord, is this the time? Will this be it? And he answered them, it's not given to you to know the times of the season that have been appointed unto the Father, but you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. He came back to the issue, the subject of the empowering for service in the meantime, before the kingdom is established. So, Lord, and they were demanding, they were very forceful, pushy, Lord, when are you going to set up the kingdom? And Jesus answered them, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. That is, it doesn't come now with an outward show. It's not something that you're going to see immediately. Now, what we've been reading about the kingdom of God is an outward show. When the desert blossoms like the rose, that's going to be an outward show. When the children are playing with the lions and the bears and all, that's going to be an outward show. When there's no longer this wild nature among the animals, but each one will be tame and domesticated, that will be an outward show. When lame people are leaping and the mutes are singing and the blind are seeing the glories of the sunset, that will be an outward show. But at this present time, Jesus said, the kingdom is not coming with an outward show. You're not going to see it, or you don't see it. Outward observation. For the kingdom of God, he said, is within you. Now, the Greek word translated within is entos, and it is the preposition, or it is the Greek word for among. The kingdom of God is among you. Surely he would not be saying to these hypocritical Pharisees, who in a few moments he's going to be calling them whited sepulchers and everything else, surely he would not say the kingdom of God is within you. You see, he's not saying that to the Pharisees. He is saying the kingdom of God is among you. You don't see it, but it is among you. He was the king. His disciples, who had submitted themselves to his authority, his disciples who had bowed to his rule, they had entered into the kingdom of heaven. And so the kingdom of God is among you. I am the king. And those who bow to my reign and to my rule in their lives are the subjects of this kingdom. Those who have submitted to the authority of the king. The kingdom of God exists now. And if you have submitted to the authority of Jesus Christ, you have entered into the kingdom. And should already be experiencing some of the glories of the kingdom. The glories of being a servant of Jesus Christ. The glories of walking with the king. Now he turns to his disciples. And he said to them, verse 22, The days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. He is 
telling them, I'm going to be going away from you pretty soon. You're going to desire for these days when I was walking among you. You would desire to see these days again when I'm gone. We are told in the scriptures that he was going to the Father to wait until the kingdom would be turned over to him. He said to his disciples, if you love me, you would rejoice because I said I'm going to my Father. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 12 and 13, it says, but this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth waiting until the enemies, his enemies, be made his footstool. So he's there right now at the right hand of God just waiting until God subdues the enemies. And the Father will then present to him and give to him the kingdom. Psalm 2 is a psalm that relates to the kingdom and that period that will immediately precede the kingdom as the psalmist said, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? For the kings of the earth have set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. But he that sits in the heavens will laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them... Excuse me, I jumped two pages. In his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure... Yet have I set my king, the Lord said, on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. And kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. So the Father will say, Ask of me, I'll give you the heathen for your inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. The kingdom will be established at that time when Jesus comes again. Now Jesus said to his disciples, there will be those who will be saying, see here it is, or see there it is, but he said, don't follow them. We are living in a day in which many people are beginning to say this is the way to set up the kingdom. A guy by the name of Benjamin Cream, remember those full page ads that he put in the major newspapers across the United States and in Europe saying, you know, the Messiah is going to reveal himself. And they're, they're gearing up now for another uh, news blitz for another big advertising campaign that the Messiah is about ready to reveal himself. And uh, this Messiah, of course, is uh, coming out of a combined uh, amalgamation of religions and so forth. There are many people today who are declaring that they have found the way to inner peace, you know. They found it through meditation. They found it through yogi or whatever. And Jesus said that this is going to happen. They're going to say, here it is, there it is. But he said, don't follow after them. Because when the kingdom comes, 
It's not going to be some kind of a secret thing that's done in a corner. Everybody's going to know it. It's not something you're going to have to advertise in the L.A. Times to let people know that it's taken place. Everybody will know. For Jesus went on to say to his disciples, For as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part of the heaven and shines to the other part under heaven, so also shall the Son of Man be in his day, as lightning streaks across the sky and everybody sees it. You know, lightning, you can, you can see it even when the drapes are closed. <laughs> and when it strikes nearby, I mean, it, there, there's something about lightning is very observable. It's not something that uh, you, you are prone to miss seeing. And Jesus is saying that when he comes to establish this kingdom, it'll be like lightning that flashes across the sky. We are told in Revelation, behold, he cometh and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him shall wail because of him. In Matthew 24, Jesus said, And immediately after the tribulation of those days shall they see the sign of the Son of Man coming with clouds and great glory. And all of the nations shall then wail because of him. And so Jesus said, For as lightning, so shall also the Son of Man be in his Day, that last phrase, in his day. Before the crucifixion, Jesus said, This is your day. It's the day of man. And he submitted unto the cross. He submitted actually to the will of the Father, which involved going to the cross. But to man, he said, this is your day. But his day is coming. The son of man in his day. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 31, when the son of man shall come in his glory and all his holy angels with him, then he shall sit upon his throne of glory in his day. And that's what we wait for. That's what we pray for. That's what we're looking for. The day when Jesus comes, the Son of Man comes in his glory and sits upon his throne. And he begins his rule over the earth. Now, as we have seen, the Old Testament was filled with promises, prophecies, and predictions of the kingdom of God, what it was going to be like, the glorious reign of the king. Jerusalem coming into its glory, becoming the capital of the earth, and the kings of the earth coming to Jerusalem to learn of God. And the law and justice going forth, righteousness proceeding from Mount Zion, and the reign of the Lord over the earth from Jerusalem. Because of all of these Old Testament prophecies that related to the coming king, and the establishing of that kingdom and his throne in Jerusalem, the Jews looked only at these prophecies that spoke of the glory of the kingdom of the Messiah. What they overlooked or what they saw but did not understand and spiritualized were those other prophecies of the Messiah 
that spoke of his suffering, of his being despised and rejected, of his being put to death. And when God speaks of his suffering servant in Isaiah 52 and 53, they spiritualized those scriptures and said, the suffering servant is the nation of Israel. It is Israel who has been despised and rejected of men, have become a people of sorrows acquainted with grief. wounded and bruised. And they totally spiritualized the 53rd chapter so it had no meaning. This is one reason why I hesitate to spiritualize scriptures. Because in so doing, many times, you lose their meaning. And this was what happened to the Jews. Though there were the scriptures that talked about the shepherd being smitten, scriptures that spoke about him being betrayed, sold for 30 pieces of silver, his hands and his feet being pierced, and the agony of his death, They did not want to believe that that could happen to their Messiah, and they could not see how he could reign as king over the earth and still be despised and rejected and die. And thus the cross of Jesus Christ was a stumbling block to the Jews that was inconsistent with their concept of their Messiah. And thus, he was despised and rejected. And thus, he was put to death by them, according to the predeterminate counsel and foreknowledge of God. But the whole problem of the diverse declarations concerning the Messiah that are in such opposition to each other. One where he is reigning as king over the whole earth and the other where he is despised and put to death. The whole problem is solved in the two comings of Jesus. The coming the first time to fulfill that portion of prophecy that dealt with his sacrificial death in order to put away our sins. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. For all we like sheep have gone astray. We turned every one of us to our own ways and God laid on him the iniquities of us all. He was smitten. For the transgressions of my people, he was smitten, God cried. That was man's day. But his day is coming when the Son of Man comes in his glory. And that will be the day that he speaks of here, the day of the Son of Man in his day. How my heart yearns for that day to come. How I long to see this world under the righteous reign of Jesus Christ. How I long to live in that kingdom age. To live in a world where there will be no fear of war. No fear of your grandchildren being molested. No fear of AIDS or other plagues. A world in which there will be no handicaps. We get rid of all of our handicap parking stalls.
No aging processes, but just a glorious, glorious new age that God is bringing to pass. All of man's endeavors to bring the new age are doomed for failure. We have today a very strong and powerful new age movement and Again, Jesus said they're going to say, it's here, it's there, you know. He said, don't follow after it. The world cannot know the new age until Jesus Christ comes to reign as king, his day. And that's why every day, throughout the day, Every time I read of some calamity in the world, every time I face some heartache or sorrow or grief or uh, have to console someone because of the situations that have arisen, I pray in my heart, Oh God, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done here in this earth like it is in heaven. Hasten, Lord, the day of thy reign over the earth. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. My prayer. Shall we pray? Father, we long for thy kingdom to come. We see the world, Lord, in the throes of death. The agony the convulsions, the misery. Oh God, we long for your kingdom to come. We long for those days to happen, Lord, as we read in the scriptures. The days of righteousness, the days of peace, the days of safety. Lord, come quickly. In Jesus' name, amen.